I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with author Jacob Lieberman to talk about his book, Luminous Life, How the Science of Light Unlocks the Art of Living. I hope you'll enjoy the interview. I'm really curious, what do you mean when you say we can live on light? Well, we can. Um, I could tell you all kinds of fascinating stories, including the fact that I once did an experiment on myself in 1994 where I didn't eat for nine weeks. At the time, I didn't think of it in terms of light, but now I know that it was in fact light. So how do we live on light? Well, if I said to you, does a plant live on light? You'd say, oh yeah, I guess it does. Because not only does light guide the entire development of a plant, it's just taking in that light all day long. Well, we never thought of ourselves as human beings being in any way like plants. But plants, animals, and humans respond to light in essentially all the same way. So we, when we think of light, we think of eyesight. We see. Well, first of all, light is invisible. You can't see light at all. What we experience is brightness, which is something totally different than light itself. But light, when it enters our eyes, a certain portion of it, about 25%, has to do with eyesight and vision. 75% of it goes to the portions of the brain that control all of our life-sustaining functions. So every cell in the body is receiving information about light and darkness and the characteristics of light and is continually uh, orchestrating its function in order to synchronize with mo itself with Mother Nature. But every cell in your body has eyes. Every cell in your body has eyes that not only see the light, but respond to it accordingly. And that's going on throughout your whole body. So what we know right now, and I'm not, I don't know the science behind this, but I know people that are involved in this. What we know scientifically now is that about a third of the calories or a third of the energy that our body produces has to do with the food we eat. Two thirds comes directly from light. Now, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, if you went to Switzerland, they would have people laying out naked on top of the highest mountains to get as much light as possible to heal all kinds of awful conditions, tuberculosis, all kinds of amazing conditions having to do with light. So we're really in a light age right now. When, when my first book, Light Medicine of the Future, came out, I was just introducing these things to the general public. Now it's one of the most widely um, researched areas in science and medicine. We're beginning to realize that every physiological function is light dependent, that we cannot live without light. And most of the energy our body creates is from light. There is, uh, in the book, I give the example of a yogi named Prahlad Jani, who is documented. He does not eat. He does not drink. He's undergone extensive medical documentation on numerous occasions. They cannot figure out what's going on with him. And he has been doing this, I think, since he was about seven years old. And I think he's around 70 now or maybe close to 80. Had I not experimented with this in 1994, and I experimented because I actually met someone who told me they were doing this in Australia, and then I met a whole group of people that said that they had done this and had not eaten in a year. And I said, huh? I wasn't, I didn't know what to make of it, so I experimented with it and realized, oh, there's something to this. Now, I love to eat, so I have no interest in not eating, and I'm not suggesting anyone should even think about doing this. Why I'm sharing it with you, because you asked, is because I had a direct experience. 
I could tell you someone else did it or I've read about it. Well, that has some value. But I'm sharing with you that I personally did it. And now, being a scientist and a physician that dealt with this for years, now I realize that it had to do with the light, that it was directly related to the light. But at the time, I didn't know. And so I think we're discovering some amazing things about light. And, you know, this whole book is that we're guided by light, not in some metaphysical sense, not in just spiritual talk. We are literally light, guided by light in the same way as a plant is. And, uh, in fact, uh, two Nobel, three um, scientists from the U.S. got the Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology just two days ago that they have actually found the mechanism within our cells that has to do with adapting our body to the continually change, changes in light and darkness throughout the day. So, it's a fact. This body takes in tremendous amounts of light and we're beginning to discover some amazing things about light and I hope this new book will take the person to a place where they can begin to incorporate some of these things into their everyday life. What is a practice that you could recommend to really help us uh, ground some of these ideas that you've shared into our daily lives? Okay. I'll, I'll share with you some things that, that, that people could do and then I'd like to speak to you about practice and how maybe practice doesn't make perfect. So one thing is Get outside every day. If you can, find a place where you can allow larger sections of your body to directly receive light. So if you like to walk, uh, if it's a, a male, take off your shirt. You don't have to do it in the middle of the day when it's really hot. It can be early in the morning or later in the day. But let large sections of the body uh, receive the light. If you're just laying in the yard, <clears throat> start out with two to three minutes. Increase by a minute a day. What happens is your skin thickens and it begins to protect you from burning and so on. But then you're getting your minimum daily requirement of light when you're inside with artificial lights and all that, which most people are you suffer from malillumination <clears throat> in the same way as someone who didn't have a very good diet would have malnutrition. We need a minimum daily requirement of light. So if you can spend some time each day, half an hour a day might be what you want to build up to, um, you'll find that your body will adjust to different light conditions. It's also nice to be outside without sunglasses. Sunglasses are fine if you're driving directly into the sun or if you're out on the ocean, but to wear them all the time, I don't think is very, very helpful. Your eyes need, need the light to come in. And the light from the sun, that's nature's optimal fuel mix. That is the optimal fuel for the running of this body. When we put glasses on that filter out certain portions of the spectrum, we're reducing the octane level. And what happens is we don't get all the nutrients that we can. So I'm not suggesting that people don't use sunglasses if they need them because they're excessively sensitive to light. But most people are hypersensitive to light because they use sunglasses automatically. So I'm saying just do experiments so you can find out what's true and what's truth from your own direct experience rather than what you hear people saying. Um, People think that if you're out in the sun, you're going to get melanoma. The people that get melanomas, for the most part, are the people that spend most of their time indoors, not outdoors. So there's a lot of ideas that we guide our lives by that we don't know from our own direct experience. So direct experience is a key piece because the awareness that we get from a direct experience is curative in and of itself just the epiphany can begin to change things. So spend a little time each day outdoors is a wonderful thing that you can do. 
Look less and see more. Spend time without your glasses on. A lot of people wear glasses. It's the biggest health epidemic in the world. Spend a few minutes a day without your glasses at home where you feel safe. Maybe take a little walk around. Allow more light to come in the eyes. What I'm really saying is we need to find the truth beyond belief. You see, everyone today talks about, oh, this is my belief system and you need to change your belief system and so on. But if you look at a thesaurus, you'll see that belief means the same as concept and theory and idea and thought. But the opposite of belief is truth. What we're really looking for is truth beyond ideas. The only way we encounter that is through the, our own direct experience, to, through experimentation. So spend a little time outdoors, get the belt, health benefits of that gradually. Spend some time without the glasses. Wonderful. Visualize colors. Think about the rainbow of colors and just visualize yourself sitting in a space. And I, I give an example of how people can do this in the book with each of the colors. Notice how some colors are comfortable and how some are not. See if you can spend a little bit more time with those that you initially recoil from to see if there's something beautiful in there to discover. You might uncover a piece of yourself that you were never aware of. When people remove their glasses, one of the things that happens is they begin to feel all these things that were present before they got their first pair of glasses. They begin to feel the same lack of insecurity or feeling out of control or they might remember things that happened very early. When that occurs, very often their eyesight improves instantaneously. I mean, it can happen like that. So, what I'm uh, suggesting for the reader is to try things as suggestions. Not to believe anything that I say, nor to disbelieve anything that I say. But if something intrigues you, to look at it to try it, to experiment with it, to see what's actually there. And the other thing is to notice how every time we think, we stop breathing. And of course, breathing is crucial to living. It's also crucial to receiving the guidance from the universe's intelligence. When we think, we hold the breath. When we hold the breath, the field of vision collapses. As it collapses, we begin to experience life through a whole rather than as a whole. So we see less. We respond to less. So it's very, a very valuable thing is, I, in the book I mentioned these little one-minute meditations. It's very simple. Close your eyes when you're sitting on the toilet or wherever you are, or you're sitting in a bus or in a train or someone else is driving. Close your eyes for a second and just notice your body expanding and contracting. And as you become very aware of that, you'll also become aware of when it's stuck. And so the awareness of that will turn it back on. So practice. We all want to know, what do I have to do? We're all addicted to doing. What this is all about is something very different. It's actually seeing something in a new way that causes your brain to rewire itself. It's not, oh, I do this exercise every single day and after 20 days I'm a new person. If something is not natural for us, we will not continue to do any of these exercises. Or we'll find this gadget interesting when we buy it, but then it'll sit in our closet. So I like to make suggestions to, to people to do for one minute or for 30 seconds. Notice whatever you notice and then do it for 30 seconds at another point. Life is so busy these days. You know, we are 
continually dealing with weapons of mass distraction all the time in our life. So if I ask you to do something else, you might get excited for a week or two, but then it's, it's probably not going to happen. So can I introduce something in very tiny bites that does not interfere with your life, which is already full, and just reminds you of something? And that simple reminder is incredibly potent, incredibly potent. So I don't do any practices in my life. My life is my practice. And this is the last thing I'll share with you. Take care of everything you notice, because everything you notice is what's looking for you. So when, when we uh, wash our face in the morning, and there's water around the sink, dry it. If the bed is not made, not I'll do it after breakfast, the reason we notice it at that moment is because that is the moment that it's designed to happen. That's why the universe brings it to us. See, we don't have to look for anything. It's all looking for us and it enters our awareness at the precise instant that it is designed to be dealt with. Nothing builds up. You're complete. There's no phone calls that aren't answered. There's no emails that are not answered. Um, anyone that's worked with me here knows that I respond pretty immediately to things. Not because I wear my underwear too tight. Because this has become, my meditation is no longer sitting. I'm not, I wasn't born in India. I don't live in a cave. I'm in the West and my life is filled with things. I need to be able to have a living meditation, not just for 20 minutes, but for as many hours as I am awake. And so my meditation is I take care of everything that calls to me. And the beauty of that is after a while you realize you don't miss anything. And you develop an authentic security in your own beingness. That's it.